Today we will introduce the tensor quantities that describe the kinematics of fluid flows. If we consider an Eulerian view of a fluid flowing with coordinates x1 and x2 and a velocity vector field v as a function of x, this could be a steady flow. If v is also a function of t, then it's called an unsteady flow. Note, however, that even the steady flow can involve accelerations as a particle moves from one point of the flow to another where the velocities are different. If the velocity field is constant, then we don't really have a flow at all. All we really have is a rigid body motion of the entire field. So much in the same way that to consider shape change, we considered the gradients of displacement, since displacements alone could just be a rigid body motion. Well, we do the same with velocities. If every point in the fluid was had the same velocity, then the fluid really wouldn't be flowing. It would be like a milk truck driving along the freeway. Every particle in the milk would have a constant velocity, but the milk wasn't actually flowing. It was just undergoing a rigid body motion. So in the same way that shape change requires gradients of displacement so that lengths will change, flows require gradients of velocity. So now we can consider an element of a velocity vector dv related to an element of uh, position vector dx through a tensor L, and the components of that tensor from the chain rule of calculus would be del bi del xj. And this tensor L is called the velocity gradient tensor. Like the deformation gradient tensor, there's no uh, requirement or expectation that it be symmetric. In general, it's not symmetric. Unlike the deformation gradient tensor, we can decompose it, uh, but not through the polar decomposition theorem, but rather through the simpler additive symmetry decomposition. So we decompose L into a symmetric part and a skew-symmetric part as follows. So L will equal a symmetric part, which is one-half of L plus L transpose plus a skew-symmetric part, one-half of L, minus L transpose. And the symmetric part is called D, the rate of deformation tensor or the strain rate tensor, and the skew-symmetric part is called W, the spin tensor. So therefore, the components of D will be one-half del Vi del Xj plus del Vj del Xi, which looks very similar to the Cauchy strain tensor with V instead of U, and in fact the components of the rate of deformation tensor are often also referred to as the components of the strain rate tensor. So we see that D is a linear expression, there's no quadratic terms, and it's equivalent to the time derivative of the linear Cauchy strain rate tensor. In other words, since VI is del ui del t, there, and epsilon ij, the Cauchy strain tensor, is one half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. Then that means that dij is one half of del vi del xj plus del vj del xi will be the same as del eij del t or in tensor direct notation, d is equal to epsilon dot. The components of w are one-half del vi del xj minus del vj del xi, which is skew symmetric. And these are called the components of the spin tensor. The spin tensor w is related to another useful quantity called the vorticity vector, lowercase w, which is defined by the curl of the velocity vector. So w is equal to curl v. Or in index notation, wi equals eijk del vk del xj.
And so we can show that the spin tensor, capital WJK, its components are related to the vorticity vector by minus one half EIJK little wi, and the inverse of that relation is little wi equals minus EIJK capital WJK. So to prove this, we need to use the E delta identity that we introduced earlier. Now the way that we wrote the E delta identity was E I J P E R S P equals delta I R delta J S minus delta I S delta J R. We need to rearrange this to put it in a form that's more useful for us. So we're going to recall that cyclic permutations of E are the same. So if we'll cycle P to the front of this expression of each of these, then we'd get E P I J times E P R S must also equal delta I R delta J S minus delta I S delta J R. And now we're going to substitute J here for I K for J, L for R here, P for S here, and I for P here. So the same expression, just using different set of indices, will become E I J K E I L P equals delta J L delta kp minus delta jp delta kl. So now we can use this version of the delta identity to expand our expression wjk equals minus one half eijk little wi using the definition of little wi as eilp del vp del xl. So this will now become WJK was minus one half EIJK times EILP times del VP del XL. And now we'll use our E delta identity and this product will become minus one half delta JL delta KP minus delta JP delta KL times del VP del XL. Now expanding this out, we'll get minus one half delta JL delta KP times del VP del XL minus delta minus minus one half so plus one half delta JP delta KL times del VP del XL. This turns L to a J, P to a K, J, P to a J and L to a K to give us this one half del VJ del XK minus del VK del XJ which is our original definition of the components of the spin tensor. So this is the result that we wanted. We've now proven this expression relating the components of the spin tensor to the components of the vorticity vector through the permutation symbol E. Let's do an example for this simple case of a 2D plane shear or Kuwait flow defined by the velocity vector field as a function of x1 and x2 as v1 equals alpha x2 and v2 and v3 are zero. What are the components of the rate of deformation tensor and the spin tensor? Are they for d a 1 alpha upon 2 0 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 or 0, alpha upon 2, 0, alpha upon 2, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0. Or this matrix here with 1 half alpha in this position. Similarly for the spin tensors, your choices are 1 minus alpha on 2 and alpha on 2 here, 0 everywhere else. Alpha upon 2 here minus alpha upon 2 here and 0 everywhere else. Or 0, alpha upon 2, 0, minus alpha upon 2, and 0 everywhere else.
So let's start by working out the velocity gradient tensor components Lij, which are del Vi, del Xj. So that's del V1, del X1, which is 0, del V1, del X2 is alpha, and all the other components are 0. Now the rate of deformation tensor has components 1 half of Lij plus the transpose of L, which is Lji. So that gives us the symmetric matrix with component 0, alpha upon 2 and 0, alpha upon 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So you can see just 1 half of L plus 1 half of L transpose, which was answer B. Now the spin tensor is 1 half of L minus L transpose, or Lij minus Lji. So that's now going to equal 0, alpha upon 2, 0. But now in the second row, we'll have minus alpha upon 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And that was answer 3. This next example is a rigid body rotation, but it's a rigid body rotation at a constant angular speed, omega, about the origin. So if omega is the angular speed, then the velocity vector v would be omega times the vector that's the cross product of the unit normal defining the axis of rotation and the position vector x. Now expressing this in index notation would be vi equals E i j k, the permutation symbol, times omega times n j x k. Now recall the vorticity vector. W is equal to the curl of the velocity vector, which in this case would be omega times the curl of n cross b. And that it can be shown is equal to 2 omega times n. Rather than just uh, have you accept that, let's actually do the proof by writing this in index notation. So wi would therefore be omega times, using the permutation symbol, del xq of ejkp nk xp. Now you might want to stop and take a look at that for a moment to make sure that we've used the permutation symbol correctly. But generally when we take the cross product of two vectors, then the index of the first vector will be the second index of the permutation symbol, the index of the second vector will be the third index of the permutation symbol, and then the first index will be the component of the new vector that this product is a result of. So similarly with the curl, you see we have i, q, j, the q refers to the, der to the derivative operator, and then the j refers to the component of this new vector n cross v. And then the i would be the components of the resulting vector, which we've defined to be w um, after multiplying by omega. So then rearranging that, we would get omega times e i q j e j k p times n k. Since the unit normal is a constant, uh, its derivative doesn't come into play. And then we get del x p del x q, but that is just the Kronecker delta delta p q. So now we have omega e i q j e j k p n k delta p q. Now we'll use the E delta identity, which will convert E I Q J E J K P into delta K I delta P Q minus delta K Q delta P I times delta P Q from here times N K. Now simplifying this by using delta P Q to convert this Q to a P, and this Q to a P will become omega delta k i delta p p minus delta k p delta p i 
times nk. Now delta pp is 3, so that will be 3 delta ki minus delta p pi turns the p into an i, so this is minus delta ki times nk. So now we have omega times 3 minus delta ki, which is delta ki, so we get 2 omega nk delta ki, and then finally delta ki converts the k to an i, so we get 2 omega ni. So wi equals 2 omega ni, or in vector notation, w equals 2 omega n. So that's the, vor that's the um, vorticity vector. We can also compute the velocity gradient tensor Lik as del Vi del Xk, which would therefore be del del Xk of the original expression we wrote, which is Eijk omega Nj Xk. And since the only non-constant in here is Xk, del Vi del Xk is just Eijk times omega times Nj. Now, if we look at this expression, we realize that Eijk is zero whenever i is equal to k. So therefore, the diagonals of Lik will always be zero. So what about when i is not equal to k? Well, then in that case, we note that Eijk would be the negative of Ekij, because that changes the permutation, which would mean that Lik must equal negative Lki. In other words, uh, what we've seen here is that the velocity gradient tensor is in fact a skew-symmetric tensor, which means that in this example of a rigid body rotation, then the velocity gradient tensor is the spin tensor W, and the rate of deformation tensor is equal to zero. So this is informative because it tells us that in general, if the flow contains a rigid body rotation, then that will appear in W. And so therefore, the decomposition of L into a spin tensor and a rate of deformation tensor effectively separates the velocity gradients into rigid body rotations and components that are not rigid body rotations that actually reflect flows. And so D is the part of L of the velocity gradients that doesn't include rigid body rotations, similarly in the same way that U and V when we did the polar decomposition theorem were the parts of the deformation gradient that didn't include ro uh, rotations. So what does this tell us about the significance of the vorticity vector? Recall that for a velocity vector field V, the vorticity vector omega equals curl of V. And we saw that for a rigid body rotation with angular velocity omega about an axis defined by normal vector n, that the vorticity is just 2 omega n. In other words, it has amplitude 2 omega and direction n. If omega is zero, then the flow is said to be irrotational. Here we see examples of three flow fields and the velocity vectors on circular contours surrounding a point. The first two have non-zero vorticity, but the third one is an irrotational flow. One way to think of this would be to imagine that all of the fluid inside the circle suddenly turned to a solid. If the solid was to spin, then there would be vorticity. If it stayed stationary, it would be irrotational. If the velocity field was the gradient of a potential function phi, then since curl grad phi is always zero, the vorticity would be zero and the flow would be irrotational. This is called a potential flow and is very useful in fluid mechanics.